Space is vast, dark, and empty. So, um, wait, what's that? Is it a sphere? Huh? That looks like that something like a whitish soap bubble floating in space. Zoom in. A bit more? Do you see people inside? They look like ants dashing around, doing their own things. Someone is growing food, someone is working in the lab. What kind of a sci-fi fever dream is this? Now, all this might not be as unrealistic as it sounds and looks. Right at this moment, Max Space is working on inflatable space habitats that could make living in space possible and cheap. Their biggest habitat would be as roomy as a sports stadium. They've already shown off their plans, claiming that such habitats could help humanity move off Earth in the future. According to one of the founders, there isn't enough living space in space. And if we don't make it cheaper and much, much bigger, we're not going to get very far in space exploration. As for expandable habitats, they are clever. At first, they're small enough to fit on a rocket, but once they're in space, they inflate to create a much bigger living area. For example, one of such habitats with around 3,500 cubic feet of space would cost way less to make than a traditional metal module of the same size. For comparison, the ISS has about 13,700 cubic feet of living space, so this is a big deal. Similar space habitats already exist. A company called Bigelow Aerospace launched two test modules, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, back in the 2000s. And another module, called BEAM, has been attached to the ISS since 2016. Sadly, Bigelow closed down in 2020. But now, Max Space is taking the tech to the next level. They're using a totally new design to make their habitats expand reliably and on a much larger scale. They're planning to test them in space soon. In 2026, they'll send up a module the size of two suitcases on a SpaceX rocket. Once it inflates, it'll have about 700 cubic feet of pressurized space. They've already built a full-size prototype to test on the ground and are now making the real thing for space. While this first one won't support people, it'll have the same strength and shielding powers as future human-rated habitats. Colonies on the Moon and Mars, floating space habitats. Everything seems to be all about space exploration these days. NASA, along with space agencies from Canada, Japan, and Europe, is working on something called the Gateway Program. It is basically a plan to build a space station that will orbit the Moon. Meanwhile, billionaires are busy dreaming up colonies on Mars and Venus and even launching space tourism projects. If these ideas actually work, they'd be our first step towards living in space. But there's one problem. If we want to survive out there long term, we need to figure out how to produce kids in space. Should it be natural ways? Are we going to start using special technologies? Space reproduction is super tricky, and the biggest issues are radiation and gravity. That's where Spaceborn United, a company from the Netherlands, comes in. They're working on solutions for this. They've built a tiny IVF and embryo incubator that's ready to be tested in space. Just recently, they've dropped it from about 12 miles above Earth to see how radiation affects organic materials. The CEO of Spaceborn United has explained that their goal is to figure out if conception and early embryo development can happen in space. If we're serious about settling on Mars or other planets and making those settlements fully independent, we'll need to solve this reproduction issue. For example, Mars has way less gravity than Earth, and no one knows if that's enough for embryos to grow properly. Spaceborn United is starting by studying how partial gravity, like what Mars has, might affect development. It's still early to speak about some results, but at least we've started moving in this direction. Even if we deal with the Space Kids problem, what about other earthly things, like plants? Photosynthesis has had a massive impact on Earth. When organisms started using sunlight to make energy, it triggered the Great Oxygenation event. It filled the atmosphere with oxygen, allowed multicellular life to develop, and even formed the ozone layer, which protects us from the sun's harsh UV rays. Thanks to that, life was able to move onto land. 
but how would plants grow under the light of other stars? Our sun is a G-type star, called a yellow dwarf. It feels like a typical star to us, but it's actually pretty rare. Only about 7-8% to of stars in our home Milky Way galaxy are like it. And since most stars aren't like our sun, scientists studying habitable planets are focusing on more common types. K dwarf stars, for example, are smaller than our sun, about 50-80% to of its mass. But they're more stable and last much longer, up to 70 billion years, compared to the sun's 10 billion years. That's a lot of extra time for life to evolve. Despite this, researchers have often focused on M dwarfs, aka red dwarfs. They're the most common stars, but they have their own issues, like frequent flares. In a recent study, researchers have simulated the light from a K dwarf star to see how two photosynthetic organisms would respond. They chose garden cress a fast-growing plant often used in salads and cyanobacteria, a tough microorganism that can survive extreme conditions. The goal was to see if photosynthesis would work under K-dwarf light. Then, they put watercress seeds in three different conditions, sunlight, simulated K-dwarf light, and no light. The plants under sunlight and K-dwarf light grew similarly but the seeds under K-dwarf light actually sprouted a bit earlier and had slightly larger leaves. It means that plants could potentially thrive under K-dwarf light just as well as they do under sunlight. So, K-dwarf stars seem like a great option for finding habitable planets. Unlike M-dwarfs, they don't have intense flares that could harm life, and their habitable zones are far enough out that planets wouldn't get stuck in tidal locking where one side of the planet always faces the star. K-dwarfs also become habitable sooner in their lifetimes because their harmful radiation drops off faster than that of M-dwarfs. But how about this? What if life doesn't actually need planets to survive? That's the idea two scientists from the University of Edinburgh want you to consider. We've always assumed planets are crucial for life because they provide the right conditions liquid water, temperatures and pressures to keep it liquid, and protection from harmful radiation. But what if life itself could create those conditions in space? The researchers suggest that ecosystems could generate and maintain the conditions they need without needing a planet. Life could create barriers and structures to keep water liquid, let in light for photosynthesis, block harmful UV rays, and even maintain the right pressure and temperature. And all of this in space, far from any planet. These barriers could work in regions between 1 and 5 astronomical units from the Sun, which includes areas closer to Earth and Mars. Gravity and planets might not always be necessary for stable environments. Biological systems might be able to do the job themselves. Earth is a perfect habitat for life, not only because it has water and a protective atmosphere, it's also an interconnected system where energy from the sun powers everything. Essential elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur cycle through the planet thanks to such processes as volcanism and plate tectonics. Outside Earth, things get trickier. Take the icy moons in our solar system, for example. They might have warm, salty oceans beneath their surfaces, but do those moons have nutrient cycles like Earth? And can they keep water liquid or maintain an atmosphere? These small, cold worlds don't get much energy from the sun, have no way to hold on to their atmospheres, and are exposed to harmful UV radiation and cosmic rays. For life to survive beyond Earth, it would need to adapt to these challenges or modify its environment. And if their idea is true, then perhaps life doesn't just adapt to its environment. It could also create entirely new ones. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.